I'm, uh, I'm an associate professor at University of Montana. I just moved there a little over a year ago. So this is new territory for me. So it's exciting to be able to drive up here and uh, hopefully get, get off of the road at some point. Um, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to zoom out a little bit. I was asked to talk broadly on this topic of uh, fire and climate and climate change. So we're going to zoom out, uh, think about the western US at first, and then zoom in to the northern Rockies. I'm going to start with uh, kind of giving you a very simple conceptual framework for the way that I think about the w how climate impacts fire activity. And I'm just going to use fire as the general term right now. My training is actually in, in paleoecology, which means old ecology, which doesn't sound that exciting. But what it really is, is trying to understand how ecosystems change over time. So I study ecosystem change over time scales of centuries to thousands of years. So what I'm going to be talking about today is like it's all really, really recent for me. Um, but this is the stuff that's, that's most relevant to this audience. So if we think about what, how climate impacts fire activity, fire regimes, fire behavior, the thing I want to point out here is that there's really two pathways, right, which, through which climate can impact fire. There's this direct pathway that is really intuitive to us, uh, just the direct impact of, say, fuel moisture or 1988-like uh, summer on uh, fire activity. And then there's also this indirect pathway through which climate, climate change, can impact fire activity by changing the nature of fuels on the landscape. So because fire is both biological and physical, it's a biophysical process, right? It's controlled by what's going on in the physical environment and what's going on uh, in the biological environment. So that's, that's a simple conceptual model. The next one just reminds us that when we think about any one of these variables, that they, the controls of fire, so the causes and consequences of fire, they're going to vary depending on the spatial and temporal scale that we're thinking about. Now, there's a lot on here, but those two triangles uh, over here, you guys know these, right? These are very familiar. Cub Scouts or Girl Scouts, right? What well, we need to make a campfire. We always need three variables. We can't really uh, handle more than that. Fire behavior triangle, we're all very familiar with this. Point here is that these variables explain fire at a particular spatial and temporal scale. So if we want to understand what's going to happen with a particular fire over the next couple hours or days, we're focused on the fire behavior triangle. The work that I do in, on some of, if we're thinking about you know, how is climate change and climate going to impact fire, <clears throat> that ultimately brings us up to these larger spatial and temporal scales. So regions, which we could say like northern Rockies or um, landscapes like the Bob Marshall, uh, and then years to decades and even to centuries. So <clears throat> the processes up here that we're going to think about are climate, climate change, vegetation. And one thing I like to point out here, I know we're, we've all heard the term fire regime, and I know it's familiar to most of us, but I'll, I'll take advantage of the students in the back. Uh, one way that I like to think about what a fire regime is, it's kind of analogous to how uh, weather scales up to climate. So climate is just a statistical summary of weather over uh, larger spatial and temporal scales. A fire regime is really kind of a statistical summary of fire behavior, uh, fire frequency. It's what we'd expect, um, it's what we'd expect in terms of fire based on the cumulative uh, timing, severity, effects of individual fires. Okay, so that's a little conceptual framework just again to remind us that when we're thinking about questions this afternoon, for example, we really need to call on different variables when we're thinking about fire activity at different time scales and different spatial scales. So now I'm going to benchmark to the questions that are, that are on the uh, agenda. This was, I, I wanted to uh, basically work from these to help provide some information that we could use this afternoon. And I'm going to touch mostly on this first question and then briefly on these on three and four and I'm just going to skip skip number two. So this afternoon we're going to be thinking about this question with respect to ecological, social, and political components and I'm going to focus on ecological here. First question I'm going to um, kind of provide some information for is this question of was managing 
wilderness fire or fire in general, was it harder in the past than it is now? And there's a ton of meat in there. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of context, the climate context uh, for which fire happens, right? So we can think of climate as the template uh, that both sets up vegetation across regions and sets up conditions for fire activity. And this will be review for many in, in the room. But I want to start by referencing this uh, paper by Tony Westerling and others, which came out now a decade ago. And uh, this paper had a, a pretty big impact both in the scientific community and in the management community because it was one of the first papers that documented the, a west-wide increase in fire activity measured by the, the number of large wildfires in the western U.S. on federally managed lands. And in particular, the reason it was so impactful is because it linked that to climate, and in specifically warmer temperatures in the spring and related to that uh, earlier snow melt. So this paper provided evidence of not only the increasing fire activity, but it also uh, provided evidence saying that that is statistically related to an increase in uh, spring temperatures and longer fire seasons. If you're, uh, <clears throat> if you're a scientist, you follow how many times papers are cited. Uh, this paper's been cited a lot, so 1,700 times. Uh, so it's widely used. I'm going to present a little bit of information from two following papers uh, that add on to the uh, results from Western England et al. One, a paper led by Jeremy Littell and others that extend this time period back to the early 20th century. And then I'll talk briefly about a paper that I led with Jeremy, Penny Morgan, um, and John Abatsoglu that focuses in on these patterns in the Northern Rockies specifically and extends it back a little bit further in time. So I'm going to start with some results from the Westerling paper. And um, those of you out there who, who like to find the most recent work, um, actually, as of last month, Westerling basically updated all the statistics in that 2006 paper uh, in, in this paper. So it's more or less the same paper. But now the time series extends out. You know, so you could ask the question, are these trends still robust? And in a nutshell, the answer is yes, they're still robust. So here's the kind of stepwise, decade by decade increase in fire activity. Again, this is across, these are forest fires across the western US. And this is hectares burned in millions here on the y-axis. And importantly, this goes from 1970 through 2012. So big picture, we know this. We've seen this graph um, or some version of it several times. One thing to to point out in Westerling's work and those west-wide trends is that the Northern Rockies, where we are, actually is responsible for a large, it's responsible for a large proportion of that increase. And you can't see these numbers, but I'm just, uh, I'm going to uh, highlight the order of magnitude. When you look at those increases and you benchmark them to fire in the early portion of the record, let's see, so relative to 1972, 1973 to 1982, these changes are extremely dramatic. So it was really interesting this morning to hear the perspectives of how fire was, how fire operated in the 70s and early 80s. And you know, you were highlighting 1984, 1988 as kind of these points where it changed in your mind. And that sure enough comes out in, in these statistics. So if we look at patterns in the mid 80s to early 90s. This is a 2,000% increase in area burn, right? So that's kind of just a crazy number. 2,000% increase, 1,700% increase, almost a 3,000% increase. So these are big dramatic numbers, which are basically just saying, yes, fire is increasing. What what I want to, uh, <clears throat> what I want to do with, as we go to these next studies is just you know take a look back further uh, back into the 20th century to provide us a little bit more context. The other statistic that we've talked about uh, <coughs> that comes from this study and others is this lengthening of the fire season. So here are the current stats uh, from Westerling's paper on fire season length. 
This is the entire west and this is the northern Rockies. And again, I'll just, you know, northern Rockies has some, some dramatic changes, but again, I'm just going to point out that it's relative to this early period. So 50 days, 100 days, we're almost up to three times as long here. So fire season is getting longer, we've heard that, but it's almost three times as longer. So that helps us uh, address that first question. So Jeremy Littell's work extended this data set back prior to 1970. So if you remove that box, uh, this is a pattern that I know many of you are familiar with. This is what the Western US. But we know in the early 20th century, there were also many years with large area burned. So this increase in itself is not, it's not unprecedented even on time scales of 100 years, which again, in the grand scheme of things, is a short, short time period. Jeremy's work also showed that this pattern can be explained, not 100% explained, but it's strongly linked to the nature of climate over that time period. And here I'm going to move to the work um, that I did with Jeremy and Penny Morgan and John Abatsaglu. Now we're going from the west-wide time series just to a time series in the northern Rockies. So actually, you know, up here is the map over here, zoomed on. So we, we've, took it, we've taken advantage of uh, a lot of the wildfires in wilderness areas in the northern Rockies here for research. This is the time series for the northern Rockies, 1910 fires still remain as the record-setting fire year in this region. The increase that we see uh, in, that's similar to the west-wide increase. And when we look at climate conditions over this time period, I'm just drawing, two, drawing out two variables here. The top graph here is spring temperature, March, April, May temperature. And this is growing degree days, which is an accumulation of temperature over the whole year. So these are both temperature-related variables. Red is warm, fire conducive. Blue is, is cooler, less fire conducive. And we can see that this period in the middle 20th century, we know it's a, a period with little fire activity. And we have a lot of policy changes and land management actions going on back here. Uh, but what the climate data also suggests, they show us, is that Climate conditions, particularly with respect to fire, were less fire conducive over that time period as well. So I'll just say, uh, you know, there was less fire activity, and um, at least climate was a, was one driving factor for that. So to get to this question, was managing wilderness uh, fire harder in the past than it is now? Um, I'm I'm not going to answer that. I'm just going to provide some some context. So clearly, weather and climate conditions were less fire conducive for much of the mid 20th century. And it's also clear that they've become more fire conducive since the mid 80s. And this inflection point or change point in the around 1984 is, is clear in multiple data sets. There is precedence for strong linkages between climate and fire activity. Uh, both in recent decades, in the early 20th century, and certainly in the more distant past. And um, I will point out and acknowledge that I think we have a lot more to do to understand the role of non-climatic factors. For example, humans, it's the big one, right? Um, they're more difficult to tease out in these data sets. So I'll just say that the fact that climate and fire are correlated doesn't mean that there isn't an influence of non-climatic factors. Uh, and I'll just point out that whatever we're doing as humans, whether we're unintentionally setting fires, trying to put out fires, or working with prescribed fires, we're doing that in the context of climate. So climate can make that more difficult, uh, can make it easier, uh, or, or it can be neutral. Okay. Um, I'm going to go through this. I'll skip one slide in the interest of time. So I think we'll be good here. So how might future challenges be different from those today? Best available science suggests higher moisture deficits in upcoming decades. So I could show a lot of papers that show predictions that basically take these statistical relationships between fire and climate and then drive them with future predictions of climate. 
in a nutshell, they all suggest increased fire activity, which is intuitive. What I want to highlight here, in addition to this, the intuitive direct link here, you know, lower fuel moisture is, suggests longer fire seasons and an increased probability of burning. I just want to draw our attention to think about the consequences of fire. Post-fire regeneration it will increasingly become, be happening in a different environment. So uh, one of the interesting things I think about Andrew's presentation is, you know, we see regeneration after a single fire, after a uh, double fire, repeat fire, and Andrew's pointing out that we don't seem to have this type conversion. A question that we have in, in the scientific community is what happens if we continue to turn up that climate knob, if we continue to crank up temperature, at what point will we see regeneration failure? So that suggests that this feedback between fire and vegetation will become increasingly important in terms of understanding both what will drive fire activity and the ecological impacts of fire activity. And I think Sean is, will, will most likely focus on this, this feedback between fire and vegetation in his next talk. So I'm going to skip these three. And I want to just seed out one question for this afternoon. For this last question that we're going to talk about, how can research help? I'm curious for, for fire managers, land managers out there, what would you do differently if scientists were able to tell you exactly how the future would unfold? If we could answer all of our questions and we could, you know, if we could show you this map for 2050 with precision, would that change? How would that change uh, your decisions and your behavior? So I'll just I'll leave you with that question to think about. So we have two minutes for discussion. Have you have you taken the, the study back even further? Like uh, coming up in, in the fire organization, we always heard about from Steve Baird, for example, the uh, large fires of 1889. It looks like that fit back more into your early part of the last century and carrying on even into the later part of the previous century, 19th century, sorry. So not, not with this data source. So that data source is, all, is uh, documented fires. Uh, and we lose confidence, well, we lose confidence increasingly, but before 1901, we really lose confidence. Further back in time, we, there, there's strong evidence from the tree ring record for low elevation forests, you know, that the link between climate and widespread fire activity is strong. One of the things I want to do in my own work going back further in time is to just be able to answer the question, like, is the 1910 fire a precedented or unprecedented event, for example? And for that, we need, we need records um, across elevations, so higher elevations than, than Ponderosa Pine fire scarred forests. Instead of taking another question, I noticed number three, how might future challenges be different from those of today? Is that one that you skipped? And if so, can you just give a really quick? Oh, yes. OK. So um, future challenge. Oh, this was this one. Oh, how might future? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so gotcha. to summarize, though, uh, this link is going to be stronger. We're turning up the climate knob and this, these feedbacks are most, I'm suggesting that those feedbacks are going to be more important. Okay. Thank you.